Welcome to Agronomy Day on uh, the Department of Crop Sciences at the University of Illinois in 2020. Uh, my name is Jack Juvik. I'm a professor in the Department of Crop Sciences and the director of the Illinois Plant Breeding Center. And I'm going to talk to you today about a breeding program involved involving corn. Uh, corn is the source of natural colors for processed foods and beverages. The idea is, is here that um, we want to be able to use corn, post primarily the pericarp and alluron layers of corn, for extraction of colors that uh, can be justified uh, for commercial applications because these are natural colors and not synthetic compounds, uh, synthetic dyes. And I'll, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the program that we're involved in and uh, where it stands right now and what, what we hate and we, how we hope to be able to commercialize this process for application and adding these natural colors to foods and beverages. So the primary justification for this kind of a program is that there are a number of uh, artificial dyes that have been used over the last 30 or 40 years as sources of different colors, blue, green, red, uh, green, uh, yellow, etc. And these compounds that are made from phytochemicals, basically from oil, uh, have been used, but they've also been associated with certain concerns by the commercial sector in regards to the fact that they can uh, negatively impact on our health and growth. Uh, the one I'm going to be talking about mostly is the idea of trying to replace the dye red 40, uh, which is widely used and one of the most largest, uh, biggest, most extensively used compounds for artificial colors in foods and beverages. And what you see here is that uh, red 40 is the most widely used dye found in cereals, desserts, and drugs and cosmetics. And the problem with it is, is that there's evidence suggesting that it accelerates immune system tumors in mice, and that can also trigger allergic reactions in, in, in people and uh, create hyper, hyper, lead to hyperactivity in, in children. Uh, so these compounds, particularly RED40, are widely used in a number of cereals. For instance, Fruit Loops, um, Apple Jacks, Lucky Charms, Tricks, Captain Crunch, and a number of other cereals where uh, the artificial dyes that are, are included into these cereals have some evidence suggesting they could be uh, detrimental to, to human health. And so that's the justification of trying to look for an alternative for dyes artificial dyes and find sources of natural colors from plants. Um, the situation is we would like to be able to replace the artificial colors in our, in our foods with natural products. Uh, almost 6 million pounds of red 40 were certified for use in 2018 in the United States. Um, Red, and red 40 is the most frequently used artificial colorant. Now, art, anthocyanins are responsible for the red and purple color in many plants. These include things like vegetables, like beets and celery, or, or beets and uh, blue, blueberries, and a range of other compounds. It's also responsible for colors in many flowers. So it's a natural compound. And uh, there are certain advantages to the idea of using natural sources as a source, or plants as a natural source of colors for the, for the food and beverage industry instead of artificial ones. And one thing is that corn is a particularly good source of, of natural colors uh, to replace the uh, artificial ones that are widely used. Uh, the anthocyanins come in uh, primarily in maize, found primarily in the, the pericarp, which is the outer layer, and the next layer below the pericarp of the current corn kernel is the uh, alluron. And 
there are generally three versions of the important anthocyanins associated with color. And we have pelargonidin, uh, which is responsible for a, uh, a orange to light red, and then cyanidin, which is deep red all the way to uh, light purple. And then pionidin are all compounds found in the pericarp tissue of, of corn kernels, uh, some corn kernels, the colored corn kernels. So what our plan is, the idea is to develop a value added product in the form of anthocyanins by taking corn, that colored corn, and going, generally creating a, going through a process called dry grind, where the outer portion of the kernel, the pericarp, is removed and separated from the endosperm and the germ. The advantage of this process is that the pericarp, which has relatively little uh, value in terms of a product from corn, uh, can be removed separately and, and the rest of the kernel, which includes the endosperm and the germ, can be used for as food, fuel, and, and feed. Using a process called dry grind, the pericarp can be separated and then used for extra color extraction that can be used, uh, sold to the industry as a source of natural colorants comparable to the ones that are uh, the unnatural ones or the artificial ones, and to products of, of, that are used in, in foods and beverages. And the idea is, is that the pericarp is not very valuable, but when it comes loaded with anthocyanins, you can get a co-product from that where you actually extract the pericarp dry, the dry pericarp tissue and remove anthocyanins with uh, water and then concentrate that and, and uh, basically arrange for that, that concentrated color, colors, I should say, to be uh, a source for industry sales to food and beverage companies. And we've actually tested this to see uh, uh, if these extracts from colored corn are, uh, can be, have the properties of stability and hue comparable to those that are used in the, that are used for artificial sources of colors. And we actually found working with Kraft, which partly sponsored this program, uh, that they, we can generate similar colors uh, for red 40 and some of the other uh, dyes, artificial dyes, and generate ones that have uh, that have the right color, the hue, and also have stability comparable to the shelf life of the artificial dyes. And so that's that's a pretty good indicator that there's potential for for using these as a, a source of, of natural colors. Uh, maize in particular are very good sources of anthocyanins in corn. And we, it, they have a wide range of color sources from the pericarp or the endosperm, but we're mostly interested in the outer layer of the pericarp and the aluron directly below it as sources of the anthocyanins for extraction and use in the industry. Um, so there's, with the wide range of different colors, uh, or the range of colors that are associated with the compounds found in corn, um, this makes, improves market opportunities for processing, processed food and beverage. And also we can increase pigment concentration in corn uh, and this decreases the cost associated with generating natural sources of pigments. And using uh, our breeding program, we are in the process of developing extracts or corn genotypes that vary in their color and concentration of the anthocyanins that they will, uh, that they can be, ex that can be extracted from corn. And this variation in uh, color and content is what we can use for a genetic breeding program to improve uh, concentrations and the hues of the extracts. The there's a number of specific genes that can be found associated with increasing 
concentration and hue of the water soluble extracts from these corn genotypes. Uh, and these are controlled by a, a range of different uh, genes that we, are, we have identified and we're working with to select for. Um, there's a gene PR1. There's a number of things that control the ratio of the different forms of anthocyanins, as well as a number of other ones that control that besides PR1. The, but we also have variation, genetic variation, in genes that control the location of where the pigments are, the anthocyanins are. And you can see on the top box on the right that we have a line that is rich in anthocyanins, uh, cyanidins specifically, that are, uh, make for a thick layer, the top layer, the outermost layer of the corn kernel. Uh, you can also find uh, variation, genetic variation in where they are located and also in the thickness of that pericarp tissue, which is associated with the concentration of anthocyanins that we can extract for from different corn lines. There's also a layer below the uh, pericarp, the outermost layer of the corn kernel, and below that is what a line, uh, basically a layer of cells uh, in the allurone tissue, which is also a potential source of variation for content and hue. We spent a lot of time doing uh, research using extraction protocols and also a machine called the HPLC, which is high pressure liquid chromatography, which will take a very complicated extract, an anthocyanin extract, and break it down into all of the different forms of the anthocyanins and their, uh, to identify variation at the chemical level using a, the HPLC analysis, which gives us the concentration and color of, of the hue or the hue of the different lines. And this kind of variation associated with the chemistry, the variation in the chemistry and the genetics controlling that is what we are using to, to base our breeding program for selection for the lines that we're most interested in for commercial release. So this generates the basic data that which we can use to make selections from our from the variation of materials in the uh, in our in our breeding populations. So to develop the most promising genotypes for commercial utilization, we basically had to start by doing a survey of over 400 different lines of corn from all over the world for variation in the concentration of the various anthocyanins that I took, talked about earlier. The problem we not a problem, but what we found was sources from Latin America, particularly from Peru and uh, Chile, had lines very rich in the anthocyanins, but these lines were very poor in terms of yield. Um, and more of the grain amount you have means more pigment that we can produce per cob. And these lines that we started with had very poor yield. And also they were not adapted to the mid Midwest growing conditions, which is the objective of where we want to have production of the most promising genetic lines for extraction of, of natural colors. And, and these tropical corn lines did not produce high yield, and that's a problem. So we have, we have been occupied in the last couple of years in crossing the colored corn lines that are not adapted to the Midwest into high yielding inbred varieties, Midwestern varieties that will increase grain yield. Um, but the process of transferring the genes associated with color, hue, and pericarp thickness, concentration, and variation in the chemistry requires the transferring of genes responsible for high pericarp anthocyanin concentrations. And this program requires a number of breeding generation and has been going on now since 2014. Uh, and we're moving into the process of, of starting to look for commercialization. And what we decided to do, or what we have the advantage of is that corn, um, we can use what's called hybrid vigor from the crossing between certain inbreds that produce, when crossed to make hybrids, uh, show very impressive levels of hybrid vigor where the hybrid outperforms, dramatically outperforms the size and 
in terms of, and, and quality of the kernels and the yield. And these two, uh, the two various inbreds listed here as B73 and Missouri 17 uh, are referred to as stiff stock and non stiff stock types that when crossed make very superior hybrids. So the, the idea is to develop lines, genetic materials that are hybrids from these crosses that have superior anthocyanin concentrations and put it into a supply chain as a value added product of, of added to the, uh, not only the corn, but also the fact that the pericarp extraction process uh, is a co-product that adds value to the, the, the corn supply chain. And the idea is, uh, it would be is that a, uh, basically farmers would be approached with, from companies that uh, basically provide premiums on production of specialty type corn, these company, this company, companies would then reach out to their preferred farmers and say, I will, if you grow the, these corn genotypes that we would like to buy from you, you will get uh, basically a premium on the cost so that there would be incentive for the farmer to take these on uh, and in terms of financial incentive. And Basically, they would take, we'd, they would be planted and then uh, harvested, and then after harvesting, moved to a processing plant where um, a dry grind procedure would remove the pericarp from the outer layers of the corn and use that pericarp that's been dried down for extraction of the con and concentration of the anthocyanins that could then be uh, sold as a natural alternative to the uh, artificial color and colors and the artificial dyes. And uh, this would be, have an advantage is, and, the, and basically the commercial sector is very interested in this type, uh, idea because there's, as I mentioned before, there's some negative aspects to, to health protection associated with the artificial dyes that are used today. To, um, Basically, what we wanted to do was see what, what kind of a market, what's the size of the market potential of developing these kinds of corn and uh, acceptance by growers to utilize it and the incentive associated with farmers to use it. Basically, in 2018, it was estimated that 6 million pounds of Red 40 uh, was, was added to foods and beverages. Uh, and what we were interested in doing is trying to determine how much would it take in terms of production of, of, of corn with the rich in the anthocyanins, where the pericarp is rich in the anthocyanins, to estimate uh, the size of the market possibility. And what we come up with is if you're assuming you can get at least 150 bushels of, of, this, of the hybrid corn, colored corn, uh, with an average of 1,000 milligrams anthocyanin per kilogram of corn kernels, uh, it would require basically 700,000 acres, which is about 6% of the Illinois corn acreage, uh, which would re basically require about 6% of the current Illinois corn acreages. This would, if you combined the corn production uh, from the clean Ford and Camp Champaign counties, this would give you this basically the size that would be required to completely uh, use natural anthocyanin colorants to basically remove, uh, to equal the amount of anthocyanins required as sup uh, to supplement the red dye 40 or remove or re and uh, that's that's the objective of the of what we're trying to do in terms of commercialization. And there is interest, as I mentioned before, in the commercial industry. Um, so we are now in the process where we've been breeding for a number of years to develop the best and different corn lines with different hues and, and uh, colors, and also yield. And we're looking to we're shooting for that 150 to 180 bushels per acre with uh, 
with the same amount of concentrations I just mentioned. And we basically have developed hybrids adapted to Midwest environments now by crossing it into adapted inbreds. And we have tested several hybrids in five acre, uh, five acre plots this uh, last summer, not this summer, but last summer. And the most promising hybrids that we have developed uh, will be scaled up for larger trials next year as, as, much, as, uh, as much as potentially 500 acre plots. The scale will provide a clear picture on the uh, economic feasibility of this whole program in terms of replacing or at least supplementing the, the artificial colorants found in the dyes okayed by the uh, currently in use. In addition to this process where we have lines that are interested in this and, uh, and companies that are interested in testing our hybrids for both yield and extraction, anthracyan extraction, we have also tested basically uh, using extracts from pericarp of some of the most favorable or most promising uh, anthracyan enriched lines. And we've tested them using in vitro models uh, and found that extracts from these pigments of colored corn have potential health benefits. Basically, using mice and other chemical tests, we found that uh, in these extracts of the anthocyanins from the pericarp can reduce uh, issues related to obesity uh, and reduce the problem associated with insulin resistance uh, in, in, in mice and also redu reduce incidence and symptoms associated with type 2 diabetes and colorectal cancer. So not only are these compounds natural, not only are they uh, appear to be commercially potential and uh, basically represent a corn Cope, a co-product uh, that has commercial value uh, that would make it uh, feasible as an added product during, in, the, in, the, in the corn stream production system. Anyway, I wanted to say that that's where we stand. Well, I appreciate any time and energy you have and we'll see where this goes. We're still in the phase of trying to move this from resource, basically from research into the commercial sector where it can be used as an alternate to uh, the disadvantages associated with artificial dyes. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day.